FICA will be about when it usually is, right? Around 245. Pull up a couple of other things. Getting an early start on the FICA today. Map our pen. Close that out. I swear there was one thing. Oh, yeah, right. MATLAB. Fire that up. Grab our little tablet. A little test run here. Seems to be okay. Let's do a square. Yeah, that's pretty good. Missed it? I'll try and do it again. All right, and then if we need some MATLAB, we'll have that available for us later on. So we're on to our special topics today. Um, actually, I mean, we're not on to it. We've been doing special topics here since yesterday or since uh, Monday's lecture. Um, so we're just going to keep looking at at special topics. All of the major special topics were already introduced um, in Monday's class, which were basically two two and a half. Right? There, there was you can do everything in terms of conversion the same way that we've seen for um, PFRs and CSTRs. Um, so you can rewrite material balances, energy balances, that sort of stuff in terms of conversion, um, which is sometimes convenient if you just have one reaction. If you have more than one reaction, th check the conversion out the window. Um, you can calculate conversion when you're all done, uh, but it's not really helpful to, to rewrite the, um, or try to rewrite the equations in terms of conversion because you can't. Um, conversion doesn't work well uh, as an independent variable or as a dependent variable um, when you've got more than one reaction. So conversion was one. Um, we saw the pressure drop was um, quite a bit more, I, I don't want to say um, difficult, but the equation was definitely more complicated, right? There were more parts um, to our, our pressure drop, but the, the structure looked very similar. Um, and then the last one that we didn't really go over too much because it, it hasn't changed is you can still do the, the co-flow versus counterflow for your heat exchange. Um, and it, it's, it's the same thing except it's uh, delta Q prime um, instead of, of delta Q. Um, and so we're gonna look at um, more examples today um, and then I believe even a few more on Friday uh, and then we'll have Monday off. And then when we come back, we're gonna actually change gears and, and talk about our, our final reactor, um, which is a batch reactor. The batch reactor, we'll, we'll talk about that. It, it's more of a, a tool that we use um, in order to look at how to determine rate laws and, and rate constants and activation energies and things like that um, for this particular class. Normally batch reactors, I mean, they're absolutely used in, in a production sense. Um, if you've been watching any of those chemical safety board um, videos that I had posted a couple of weeks back, um, you'll notice a fair number of reactors in there are batch reactors. Um, so it, it, it's not like, oh, we just do these for calculation purposes. We, we do full production scale stuff in, in batch reactors, especially if you have any interest in um, pharmaceuticals or, or bioengineering, that sort of stuff, that's often uh, performed in a, in a batch reactor. Um, so that'll be our topic next week, um, and that'll wind us down to the end of the, the quarter. The project, um, the very last project, the final project, will be posted probably tomorrow. Um, if you want a heads up on it, it's do the same thing that you did on the very last problem of the very last midterm, um, except with a PFR instead of CSTR. Uh, so it, it 
it will look very, very similar. The problem statement will be um, quite a bit shorter. Uh, and then you'll fill in the remaining empty parts of your um, report. So a, a little bit of uh, summarizing what you have found in each one. So let's take a look at a PBR example. That is tilted a little bit. Let me tilt my, is that, is that the right way or the wrong way? Uh, close, there we go. Look at another um, packed bed reactor example. Um, and we'll just look at this whole example all day today. Um, so it, it'll probably take us most of the day um, to look over something like this. So here's our pack bed reactor. Let's move that a little bit to the side just so we have some more room uh, to write a couple of different things. I mean, part of the thing that takes so long on these is it just takes a while to define all the stuff. Um, I mean, it's gonna take us a good 10 minutes just to define the problem. So if, if you ever get a chance like, you know, younger cousin, younger sibling, friend or something like that, that's, you know, still going through middle school math or something and they complain about word problems, just tell them like, you know, we actually do that a lot. There's a lot of word problems. Um, so the stuff coming in over here, uh, it's going to be a reaction um, A goes to B plus C, and we will uh, work on all components of that in a little bit. Uh, the feed going into our reactor is going to be 80% inert. So the energy balance should give you an idea of why we use inerts. They're kind of there to uh, in a sense, soak up the energy of reaction. Um, there, you know, as a certain amount of energy is even either given off or absorbed by the um, reaction, the inert can either soak it up or supply it. Um, so if there's 80% inert in here uh, and there's 20 mole percent A, the inert is probably carrying along either some energy in order to keep the reaction going if it's endothermic or as sort of a sponge to soak up some of that energy if it's um, an exothermic reaction. Uh, feed rate total is going to be 18 kilomoles per hour. Um, it's a gas phase system, so it's going to come in uh, with a temperature of 500 K, uh, and it's going to come in with a pressure of 6 bar. Um, we often run gas systems um, at elevated pressures. Uh, definitely with a, a packed bed reactor, those tend to be run at elevated pressures uh, for, for two reasons. One, if, if you increase the pressure, you have squeezed all the molecules closer together. And so for the same volume or volumetric flow rate, you're actually pumping in more molecules, which is, is good. Um, but the other reason is the, the reason that we saw on Monday's lecture, um, which is in order to, to force those molecules through a, a bed of catalyst particles, you need pressure. Um, and that pressure gets used up in the act of pushing those molecules through the bed. Um, and so we often have these at fairly high pressures to ensure that they can make it through the, the entire bed um, that's coming out through the other side. The reactor is, um, it's going to be jacketed by steam. So I'll just temporarily delete this. So um, out here will be saturated steam. Um, and remember the, the condition of saturation from, um, I mean, we probably briefly touched on it in 100, um, but you probably did more of it in uh, 102. Uh, that saturated means it's at its uh, boiling point for whatever temperature um, or pressure that it's at, or sorry, whatever pressure it's at. So this is saturated steam um, at 20 bar. Um, and if you go to a, a steam table or something like that and look up um, what the temperature is of saturated steam at 20 bar, uh, you'll find it's 212 degrees C, right? Not, what what's boiling in Fahrenheit? I don't even use Fahrenheit anymore. I think it's 212 Fahrenheit. Uh, but because we've um, increased the pressure here from one bar, which it would boil at 100 degrees C up to 20 bar, it'll now boil at 212 C. Um, because it is saturated, um, these conditions are constant. Anytime you see a utility like saturated steam or something like that, those are constant. As energy is either transferred to or from the utility, um, it will 
either boil or vaporize uh, or boil or condense a little bit of the utility, um, but it will do so at a constant temperature. Um, and that's what we mean. That's the implication that we have whenever we see the word saturated um, for a, a jacket. So we have a constant temperature of 212 for our um, jacket on this one. And then a little bit about our packed bed reactor, the diameter of the particles um, that are used as catalyst, or really, as, as we mentioned in, on Monday's lecture, their catalyst support, um, the, the actual catalysts are probably on the order of nanometers, um, but we support them, right? If the actual catalysts are these tiny little dots on top of here, the diameter that we're talking about is the diameter of this uh, support particle, which is 3.5 millimeters. That's the one that's important for pressure drop considerations is, is what's the size of that um, big support particle. Could be made out of graphite or like aluminum oxide or, or carbon or usually something inert. The diameter of the tube itself um, is 12 centimeters. Um, and so this diameter again is referring to uh, this geometry. We, we just got a single tube here so um, we don't have to worry about uh, whether these flows are for one tube or, or multiple tubes, it's, it's just one tube. Um, our bed density. So once we pour this packing inside of there, how much mass is there per unit volume um, is going to be 1500 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, and it'll be packed in there with a, a void fraction of 0 0.45. So of the total volume um, inside of the pack bed reactor, 45% of it is available for the, the process stream to, to flow through. Um, the reaction that's taking place in here, um, do I have enough room over here? Sure, let's, let's summarize some of our um, parameters first. So we'll have, uh, we'll go in reverse. I over here, C, B, and A. The heat capacities of everything. So, you know, this is kind of the tedious part of we have to go look this stuff up um, in a book somewhere uh, or just write it down if, if we're doing a problem like this. So we've got some heat capacities um, in joules per mole Kelvin um, and they just go 40, 20, 20, 30. So 40, 20, 20, and 30. So one thing to look for on these sorts of problems that are like, like book problems, example problems, um, is, is notice that it, the heat capacities of the products add up to the same as the reactants. So that delta CP term um, is gonna be zero. And therefore the enthalpy of reaction will be zero. Speaking of enthalpies of reaction, the enthalpies of formation uh, in kilojoules per mole uh, will be minus 120, minus one, zero, and zero. So this should give you something of an idea of what these species are. Um, once you have a, a zero and a zero for your enthalpies, those have to be elements of, of some form. Um, the example that I'm doing here is C is kind of like hydrogen and I is sort of like nitrogen, uh, but we're not actually specifying them um, in particular. And then our molar masses of everything. Uh, a is a little bit bigger, so it's 58. Uh, B is slightly smaller than that, 56. C is two, right? Kind of like a hydrogen. Um, and then our, our molar mass of our inert, if we were to need it, would be 28, um, which is kind of like a nitrogen, but we're not explicitly specifying um, exactly what is, is taking place here. We're just leaving them as, as A, B, and C. And then for our reaction, we'll just summarize this over here. Remember it was A goes to B plus C. Uh, it'll be elementary and gas phase. Um, so our rate law, or sorry, our rate constant K, 1.38 times 10 to the minus, what I say, six, two, a little bit off. Uh, 10 to the minus two per second. Um, and this is at 298K. Uh, and it has an activation energy of 32.6 kilojoules per mole. 
right? That's a ton of writing. It's, it's 214 and all we've done is summarize the problem. Uh, we haven't even actually started solving it yet. Um, all we've done is summarize what the, what the problem is. The question that we're going to um, try to ask, or, or I should say answer on this, um, is just find the maximum conversion of A. Which can seem like kind of a, a weird question to ask initially because we have um, an irreversible reaction, right? It's just A goes to B plus C. Um, and so intuitively when you see something that's irreversible, A goes to B plus C, and there's no other reaction that's producing A, if the reactor is big enough, we ought to be able to consume all of that A. Um, but what we're going to find is that for, for practical situations, we can't consume all of that A. Um, and we're gonna try to find out, is that practical consideration um, due to temperature, uh, or is it due to pressure, or is it due to both? Um, if we were to run this thing isothermally and isobarically, we could make this thing big enough that we would eventually consume all of the A. Um, but we don't run reactors isothermally and isobarically, although liquid phase ones get close. Um, and so we, we should not expect 100% conversion um, for a system like this. We would expect that either the, the energy would run out or the pressure drop would eventually become um, too big. Um, and the, the system would stop. So we're gonna set up our equations, um, kind of look through everything that we need in order to solve this, uh, and then play around with the solution once we've got it to, to try to answer this question. I'll give you a second to write everything down here. Okay, time's up, moving on. I'll leave that part down on the bottom here. Um, so our approach is going to be to use some of the, um, sh not really shortcuts, just the special cases. Um, and so one of the um, approaches is for a special case, if you just have one reaction, write everything in terms of conversion. Um, an advantage of that is if you're being asked to answer something about conversion as we are here, you've kind of got it explicitly in your equations, which is it saves you like all of one calculation when you're done, um, but it's, it, it can be convenient. Um, it, it's also a, a tool that's used um, frequently uh, on like exam type questions. Um, again, we don't have any exams in this class, not the usual kind of exam, so um, you don't have to worry about it here. Uh, but if you want to do like a PE or an FE, um, when you start studying for that, what you'll see is uh, if they give you the equations, uh, which they usually do, you'll often see them written in terms of conversion. So it, it's good to practice them um, a little bit here. So what we're going to do is write uh, the material balance, the energy balance, and the pressure drop equation, the delta P, um, as functions of XA to begin with. Uh, but we're also going to have to leave in there the temperature and the pressure. Um, we have to leave in the, the temperature and the pressure because we don't know what those are going to be like as they go down the, the length of the reactor. Um, and so those are, are unknowns. The fact that it's jacketed um, should give you an indication that it, this is not an isothermal problem. Um, therefore, the temperature is needed. Uh, and any time that you see all of this sorts of information, things like the densities and the, the sorry, the bed densities, the void fractions, particle diameters, that sort of stuff, that's giving you a heads up that you need to take into account um, pressure as well, which mostly only comes up on pack bed reactors, um, but it can show up on, on a plug flow too. Almost never shows up on a CSTR. Um, we don't need that for a CSTR. Um, so let's start off with the general equations and we'll, we'll mark where we're getting them from um, so that you can uh, grab them if you need them. So our material balance will be on the conversion of A, uh, which is dxA dW, uh, will be equal to minus RA prime divided by Na0, where again, the, the prime mark is telling us uh, this is the same as RA divided by rho bed, uh, and then of course, multiplied by Na0 again. Um, this is subject to an initial condition, which is that XA uh, at the entrance to the bed um, is going to be zero. Uh, in your book, this is equation 10.2. Uh, 
So this is one of our special case equations, right? This is the material balance that was originally written for A, now rewritten in terms of the conversion of A. The energy balance looks a little bit nastier. Let's give us a decent sized fraction here to work with. Uh, in the numerator of the uh, energy balance, that's not too bad. It's the delta Q prime. So again, that's representing our energy leaving or entering the system due to our um, utility on the outside, uh, minus our delta H. So whether we have a um, endothermic or an endo exothermic reaction is going to get covered there in our delta H. Uh, and then the denominator here, uh, if we were writing it uh, generally, which I forgot my left-hand side, which is kind of weird. This is all equal uh, to dt dw. If, if you, you scrunch those together, just throw it over on the right-hand side, it's the same thing. Um, if it were the denominator in the general energy balance, um, don't write this down because I'm going to erase it. If, if it was the uh, general, this would be sum of ni cpi, which I like, right? That That is a fairly easy thing to write. It's a fairly easy thing to, to calculate. Um, because we are writing it in terms of conversion, the denominator looks a little bit worse. Um, so it's Na0 times the sum of theta i CPI uh, minus Xa divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of A, which is a nu, that, that's supposed to be a nu, not a, a V, uh, times delta Cp. Right, to me that doesn't look mm, quite as nice. Um, it, it has some advantage to it, right? This is the, the one that's talking about, okay, if, if you're taking uh, stuff that was coming in and you have to heat it up or cool it down, that's how much energy it took, um, plus whatever the change in the um, heat capacity was. Uh, that's it's kind of convenient. Oh yeah, thank you. That's a, there's a prime right here on our R. Let's scooch that away. R prime delta H. Thank you. Um, there's a question in chat whether it's coflow or counterflow. I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. So that's our, our full expression here. Uh, and then we have a, an initial condition, which is that T at W is equal to zero uh, is 500K because that's our inlet. This equation in your book is 10.3. Right? And it's the equivalent of the energy balance except when it's written for conversion. So it only holds for um, a single reactor, or sorry, a single reaction. And then the last one we need, um, again, I'm gonna come back to the coflow counterflow here in a second, uh, is the pressure drop expression, which is dpdw. So I, I called the uh, top one, the material balance, the middle one, the energy balance. And I'm just referring to this one as delta P um, because it's referring to the, the pressure drop through the, the system. This will be minus V times a friction factor for a particle, which is F sub P um, divided by rho bed. And then multiplied by kind of an ugly looking constant group, which is 64 times the total mass flow rate uh, divided by pi cubed diameter of the pipe raised to the sixth, and diameter of the particle just raised to the, the one. Um, that's that. And then we need to know our pressure. So our initial pressure at W is equal to zero. I'm gonna change this one uh, over to bar, or excuse me, Pascal. So it is six bar, um, which is kind of high, but I'm gonna say that this is six E to the five um, Pascals not e to the five, like six times 10 to the fifth. This equation in your book, 10.15. So the, all of these equations are, are perfectly valid um, if you have one reaction. So this number that I wrote here, six bar is six times 10 to the fifth Pascals. The e that I wrote right here, this little e, um, I do that in anticipation of writing these kinds of numbers in MATLAB, because uh, six times 10 to the fifth is the same in MATLAB as six E five. That E is not exponential E. Um, so just, just keep those two separate in your mind. 
Um, and now back to that last one. So I'm going to turn this one into purple. Um, is it coflow or counterflow? Uh, if we were interested in the utility, uh, EB on the utility, if we had to write that, we would write DTU uh, DW would be plus or minus, depending on whether it's coflow or counterflow, uh, plus if it's counterflow, minus if it's coflow, times our delta Q prime, um, divided by whatever the flow rate is of our utility. So assuming it's in molar units, then that would look something like N sub U times the heat capacity of the U. A couple of things here that, that we don't have to worry about. Um, a, this problem is uh, the jacket that's used in it is saturated steam. Saturated steam has a constant utility temperature. So whatever ends up happening here, this is gonna be, end up being equal to zero, right? I don't have to look any further than knowing that it's a constant utility to know that DTU DW is gonna be equal to zero. Um, it will not change temperature. How does that work? Well, if, if delta Q prime is not zero and these are not infinity, how did I manage to get a zero here? Um, the reason for that, if you go way back to chapter four, um, is that this term down here on the bottom, so this is more like background information. This is not like, this is not needed for our particular problem um, because we're, we have a nice thermal jacket. Um, this uh, is only the case for no phase change. Right, that's, that's not the case for us. We have what's called saturated steam. Um, and so we, we do end up having a, a phase change. Um, so our version, if we were going to try to write this with a phase change, um, would look something more like, um, actually there, there's nothing over here. Uh, the denominator down here would have to be something more like um, lambda, which is our enthalpy Uh, vaporization. So if you had to worry about something happening inside of the, the saturated steam, um, you need the enthalpy of vaporization. Uh, and so if you're interested in this, um, go take a look at, uh, it's not actually chapter, um, section 4.3 in your book. Um, section 4.3 explains, well, what do I do if I, you know, need to know how much steam do I need, right? It's, it's saturated steam. It's got to be pumped in there. It's a particular rate. How do I figure out what that rate is if the temperature is constant? If the temperature is constant, then I can't be going back to this sort of an equation over here. Um, I need a different equation. We're not going to bother with that because we're just going to assume that there's enough steam there to do it. Uh, but there's an alternate to this equation that we don't use a lot um, if you have a saturated utility, um, like a saturated steam. Um, or, or a saturated water, right? If, if you're using it as a coolant um, and you're boiling water, uh, then you need a, a different um, expression for the energy balance on the utility. This utility expression that we have here is only if there's no phase change. If there's no phase change, then it has to be heating up or cooling down, um, which is explained by this, or this relationship. If there's a phase change, then that doesn't hold because there's no temperature change. Um, and so you got to go back to 4.3 for, for something like that. That's all an answer to somebody asked the question in chat. Is it coflow or counterflow? Uh, we didn't specify, but it, it won't change the way that we approach the problem because for us, um, dt u dw uh, is equal to zero. So it, it's just a constant temperature through the outside. So just sort of an aside if you ever have to deal with um, non constant uh, or sorry, constant temperature due to saturation, and then you need to know how much of the stuff is there, this will help. This is not like trying to prime you for the homework or something like that. I, I, don't, I didn't ask anything like this on the homework. It's just for you to, to know what you would do next. So what do we need to do next? Um, well, what we need to do next is figure out expressions for each one of these. So we have to write things like, if we just kind of try to eyeball what are the, what are the constants that we have here, the row bed, we're not going to have to worry about nu A. It's just going to be minus one. Pi is pretty good, don't worry about that. The diameters here, those are not gonna change. 64 is a nice round number. We don't have to change that very much. Row bed was a constant. I'm trying to think if we got, yeah, pretty much everything else, all, all of the CPs, we're gonna have to deal with those. Um, 
we did already kind of in our head calculate that delta CP is equal to zero. Um, and the reason delta CP was equal to zero uh, was just because of the way that the B and the C happen to have the same, if, if you sum these two up, they happen to be the same as the heat capacity of A. Um, and so that tells us that our, our heat capacity uh, change is equal to zero. So that'll be nice, right? That'll at least simplify that side. Um, but everything else here, uh, we're going to have to calculate, right? We need our, our delta H's and Q's and, and R's and all of that. What we have to do now is express each one of those in terms of functions of conversion, temperature, and pressure. Um, we have to get them down to nothing but functions of that and then any number of constants that we want. Um, so, well, let's get started. Give us a little divider here. So we got to write everything in terms of um, X A T P and any constant, right? Anything that we know from the problem statement, we can just kind of leave those in there and and, and not worry about them, um, right? We'll just assume that we would be able to write, you know, calculate a number with them or something like that. So let's start off with the the rate. Um, you know, if if I'm working from sort of top to bottom on my um, equations here. The, the first one that I come across that I don't know is RA. Um, so got to work on that. Or if, if you didn't write it in as RA over here, we could work on RA prime, right? That would be okay as well. But we can do RA prime, I guess. Uh, RA prime uh, will be equal to RA divided by row bed, uh, and RA, um, I mean, I've kind of started with RA directly here, um, but eventually we're going to need it in terms of, of just R, right, because that's our, our rate that we end up needing. So RA will be equal to minus one, which is our, our stoichiometric coefficient, times the rate of reaction, which is R, over row bed. The K is for R not R prime. Uh, yes, so we're gonna, we're gonna look at those units here in a minute. Um, why would you be able to say that the K that's given to us is uh, the one for the R and not the R prime? It's from the units, and we're gonna look at that here um, in a second. And my apologies, the uh, recycle is coming right now on the street outside, so hopefully that will not be too loud. Uh, just yell at me in chat if it gets too loud, and we'll just throw some music on and wait. Um, but I'll just keep talking until somebody tells me it's too loud. Um, so our rate here then will be minus K C A, again, divided by row bed. And now we have to go way back to chapter five to figure out what this C A term looks like for gases. Um, we need to write it in terms of conversion and it has to be written for a gas in terms of conversion. It's not gonna be a joyride um, in order to do that. Uh, it's gonna be minus K times CA naught divided by row bed and then times a big old mess that's next to it, uh, theta A uh, minus the stoichiometric coefficient of A divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of A, which looks ridiculous, but I'm writing it out um, so that we can see all of the terms that are in there, uh, times XA, and then in our denominator, one minus YA zero times our change in moles delta divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of A, XA, and then those um, temperatures and pressures. So the ratio of T over T naught and the ratio of P naught over P. If you happen to have forgotten where these come from, how come these particular ratios show up all the time? This is from the ideal gas law. Um, that was where those came from. That's why that ratio how come it's T over T naught and not T naught over T? Um, that came way back when from our um, ideal gas law. So we can kind of pick apart some of these to try to make this expression look a little bit simpler. Um, the theta A here, any theta I is the moles of I entering uh, divided by the moles of A entering, um, which if it's theta A is just Na0 over Na0, which is one. So that one's not too bad. Uh, the 
stoichiometric coefficient of a over a it's one um, normally it would be or, or more generally it's stoichiometric coefficient of i over um, stoichiometric coefficient of a um, so for volumetric flows is there a knot in there somewhere um, oh I, so I, I think yeah it's it's the stoichiometry mm -hmm. there was a question if I was missing like a, a v naught or something in there um, I, I may have been a little bit sloppy this is supposed to be the stoichiometric coefficient of a down there in the bottom um, XA is fine, right? We can leave that here. We're, we're trying to write things in terms of XA. All of these are okay. We have to leave them. We don't know exactly what they are except for P0 and T0, um, but we definitely need to leave the T and the P uh, because those are going to vary along the length of the, the reaction. Again, this XA, it's cool. Leave it. Um, we can calculate the, the delta, the nu A, and the YA naught here. Um, so if we were to look at each one of these, it would be 1 minus uh, 0 0.2 is the mole fraction of A coming in. Uh, how do we know that? It was just given to us, right? Right up here, we said there's 20 mole percent of A coming in. So there, there was no mystery to that one. Um, the delta, we have an A on the left as a, a product or as a reactant, and then a B and a C on the right. So one plus one minus one is one. So there's a plus one on the top. And then the stoichiometric coefficient of A is a minus one. Um, and so what all of this ends up looking like then is one plus 0 0.2 times XA, right? That's what our, our bottom or our denominator will look like. And then it'll be T over T naught uh, and P naught over P. This in your um, book, if, if you're interested in uh, like how, reviewing where did this come from, um, this was equation 5.14 in the book. Right, 5.14 was nearby the other one for liquid flows, um, where the CA, CI type terms are a little bit simpler. Um, but for a gas phase uh, flow, we have to account for the, the compressibility. So it, it looks a little bit worse. So this is also where we can try to figure out what, what do the units look like? So we know our um, RA prime. I'm going to do the units in uh, purple. Uh, DXA DW. Um, is going to be equal to, it's going to have the same units. So remember the, the symbol for units is an equal sign with a little dot above it. Um, that's going to have the same units as minus RA prime divided by NA0. Um, and that is going to have the same set of units um, as RA over rho bed times NA0. Um, so if we just briefly look at uh, the, what the units here would look like, um, maybe we don't know RA just yet, but we know generally what it would be, right? In general, it would be something like an amount, like a mole. Uh, if you hear Winston behind me, he's expressing frustration with something, so he may be barking here in a moment, but that's how it goes. There he goes. Uh, so some kind of a mole. Winston, you have to share the sidewalk. Thank you. It's his sidewalk. Uh, so some kind of a mole per volume. Um, so maybe something like, a, I'm just going to make up the units here, something like a mole per liter um, per second. Right, this is the unit of RA. It's then divided by uh, density of the bed. Um, and so the density of the bed has to be something like um, a mass per volume. Um, so maybe it's like a kilogram per liter or a kilogram per cubic meter or, or whatever, right? We're just picking units here. Um, so this is our unit of row bed. Specifically, that's our unit of row bed to the one over or to the negative one power. Um, and then it's divided by Na0, um, which is gonna be something like a mole per time. Um, so I'm just gonna pick moles per second because um, that's our uh, unit that we're just kind of picking here. Um, and so if we look at these um, units, then the, the units on XA over here would end up, the liters would cancel out, seconds would cancel out, moles would cancel out. Um, and so these units end up looking like something per kilograms of catalyst, right? This kg that's here is kilograms 
per catalyst. It, it could be, it, it's really just like one over mass of catalyst, right? It, it could be a kilogram of catalyst or a pound of catalyst or a gram of catalyst. It's just generally speaking, it'll look something like that, right? So these end up being the units of dxa uh, dw. Right, XA doesn't have any units, so the units must be one over kilograms of catalyst. So then how do we know that the K term, um, if K was given to us uh, as inverse seconds, what does this, what does that tell us? Um, well, it, it means that if the rate law is elementary, such that uh, R is equal to KCA, let's try and find out, right? Uh, whether or not those k's are the the units of k or the units of of k prime, if we assume that they are the units of just the plain old k and not k prime, then what we have to have here is something like a mole per liter per second for r, and then that has to match whatever's on the other side, right? So this k is one over seconds, and c sub a would have to be something like a molar concentration, right? A, a mole per liter. Turns out. That works just fine, right? That those units work out. Got a mole per liter per second and essentially a mole per liter per second over here. So therefore we conclude that the, the units of K that were given to us um, for this fella with the one over seconds, that has to be just the plain old K, not the K prime. If it were the, the K prime, um, then the rate law would have had to have been written as something like R prime uh, is equal to K prime times CA. If we look at the units here, the units that are expected are something like amount per mass per time, right? Kilograms of catalyst or grams of catalyst or whatever per time. Um, and then that has to be equal to whatever the units are on the, the right hand side. If again, we assume that K has units of one over seconds, uh, C will again have some kind of a unit of a mole per liter, but this doesn't work out, right? There's, there's a factor of a row bed working out uh, that's missing here um, because we see that we have a kilogram catalyst over here and a liter over here, those, those don't match, right? And because those don't match, that means that this is, is not accurate, right? We were not given um, K prime. We must have been given K because that's the only way that the units work out. And sometimes that's the only way to figure out what was given to you um, because the, the prime notation is more used like in a textbook setting um, where somebody is trying to be careful about moving them uh, or the, uh, about using them, but it is not at all generally followed. Um, if, if you go look up a rate expression for a, an actual reacting system, they most likely will not use the prime notation because um, it's not the standard. The only way to know what's being given to you um, is to really just look at the units um, and, and do a, a sort of unit check like what we've got here. So all of that is just to say the K is for the plain old R, um, which is this, right? This is what was given to us. So we have to, to work on that a little bit, which again, that's this K um, that's, that's sitting up here. Kind of lengthy, but that's, that's the only way to check, right? Just check the units on them. If you're lucky, somebody's using the prime notation, but don't count on it. Um, it, it's not always used. <sighs> That's one of them. Um, it's 243. We can knock out one or two more before um, Fika. Uh, let's see. That was our A. Sorry, our RA. So that was this one. Um, what else did we include in there? That was actually the RA over uh, the whole thing, right? RA prime. Was the NA zero in there? No. So we'll still have to deal with that. So that was this term. Cool, one down. Um, we don't have to worry about this R prime uh, because we just calculated that, right? As soon as we know R A prime, um, which is what we wrote in the expression underneath, we will know R prime. So let's go ahead and go on to the next one of, we only got a couple of minutes. Um, I think we can knock out delta Q prime and, and delta H. Um, so let's write those real quick. Um, our delta H, oh, let's switch back to black. Uh, the full version of delta H is the enthalpy under some reference condition. So maybe that's given to you, maybe it's not. 
uh, plus a delta Cp times T minus whatever that reference temperature was. So the reference temperature here, this reference is saying, at what temperature did somebody give me that delta HR? Um, if it's given in terms of enthalpies of formation, which is the most common one, that reference temperature is probably 298K um, or 25 degrees C. Sometimes you're just given the delta H at a random temperature, um, and so you can still use this expression to um, work everything out. But we already found that delta Cp was equal to zero, um, and so our delta H is going to be constant. Um, and we were given enough information that this can be calculated as the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients times their enthalpies of formation. Uh, with a little circle on it for standard conditions, uh, which I didn't actually write down. Um, so it'll be one times the delta H of B, uh, enthalpy of formation of B. I'm trying to erase that close enough. B circle uh, plus one times delta F of C to the circle plus, let's just move down, a minus one delta H of formation of A. With a little, no hat, no hat notation in here. Um, so we could write all of that out, um, calculate a number for that. Uh, I don't think I have the enthalpies tabulated next to me, but we can just kind of fill them in over here. We can probably do the math. A uh, one, might as well just write these in here. Let's see, that was B is minus one, uh, enthalpy of C was zero, uh, and enthalpy of A was 120. So if we add all of those up, uh, we will get that delta H is what, 119 kilojoules per mole. So that's our uh, an endothermic reaction, right? The delta H is positive, and so in order for this thing to, to go to any appreciable amount, we will probably have to supply some energy to it. Um, endothermic reactions tend to absorb energy from the jacket, um, which is what the, the jacket is doing, right? We have saturated steam. Um, it's at a very high temperature, uh, fairly high anyway, um, and so it will be giving us the enthalpy that we need in order to make the reaction go. Um, and then our delta Q prime, uh, will be equal to Ua over rho bed times Tu minus T. Um, and we'll just fill in some of the uh, parameters here and then switch out for uh, FICA for a few minutes. So where, if we wanted to calculate our U, this has not changed for a packed bed reactor, right? This is one over HU plus one over H. Um, our HU is for a phase change because we've got saturated steam, right? It's a constant temperature, but it is condensing. Um, and as it condenses, it gives up some of its enthalpy of um, vaporization that goes into the process stream. Uh, and so this will be approximately 2,500 watts per meter squared per Kelvin. Uh, this is for a gas phase. And there's no uh, distinction in a gas phase between whether or not it's organic or not, um, or aqueous or whatever. That's only for liquid phases. Um, and so the gas here uh, is just 60 watts per meter squared per Kelvin. This, by the way, highlights a very common problem, which is the heat transfer coefficient for a gas is way, way less than for a liquid or a phase change. It's hard to heat gases up. The molecules are fi far apart. Um, and so the overall heat transfer coefficient is basically dominated by the H that's the smallest, um, which in this case is the, the gas phase. Um, and so it's not at all uncommon to end up with, if, if it's a gas being heated by something else um, or cooled by something else, the overall heat transfer coefficient usually looks really, really close to the individual heat transfer coefficient of the gas, which is 58.6 uh, watts per meter squared Kelvin. Let's get that two right up here. Right, that U here 
is very, very close to just the individual heat transfer coefficient of the gas because the phase change on the outside doesn't really have very much resistance to heat transfer in it. It's very good at transferring heat in that sense, um, transferring energy. Um, and so the overall looks pretty much like the gas. Um, there's an electrical circuit analogy to this one having the highest resistance and this one having the lowest. Um, and therefore it, it basically just looks like the high resistance one. Um, but I mean, whether or not you want to get into electrical analogies, th there's actually a neat one for the, the whole system that goes, we don't use the, uh, not the Gibbs energy. What's the A one? The Helmholtz energy. We don't use that a lot, but there's a neat way to look at chemical reactions in terms of Helmholtz energies. Um, now I'm just rambling. It has nothing to do with what we're doing right now. So we got our delta H, we got our U. Um, this expression here, let's go ahead and kind of clean this up a little bit uh, right before we go since it's 250. Uh, this will be our RA prime uh, will be equal to all of this nonsense over here. Let's clean this up a little bit. Uh, this is in our denominator. Uh, the top will look like 1 minus xa, uh, and then out front will be k c a naught divided by rho bed times n a zero. Right, just so that we've got these things written down somewhere um, so that we can come back to them. And then we'll we'll keep working um, on this one after after feet get a little bit. Um, why is it a phase change utility? Uh, so it's, it's a good question. What do we mean by a phase change utility? There, there is actually a, a special type of uh, fluid. It's usually a liquid that's called a phase change um, fluid, uh, but that, that means something else. It's like changing crystalline structures. That's not what, really what we're doing here. Um, what we mean by a uh, phase change utility uh, is that this saturated steam, um, if you imagine it coming in initially as a, a gas here, as it goes down the length of the reactor, it will condense into large droplets. Um, and those large droplets are forming on the cool surface, the relatively cool surface um, of our reactor, right? So there'll be a little bit less gas here, um, maybe another, okay, a liquid drop can't take the shape that I just sketched in right there. Maybe there's another liquid drop, so there's a little bit less in the gas stream. If you get to the point where you have condensed it all, um, then you'll have a nice uniform layer of liquid on the outside, but usually we don't get that far. Um, so it's, it's always in equilibrium. Um, the only difference is as it goes down the length of the stream, um, that phase equilibrium shifts, or it stays at phase equilibrium, it just shifts a little bit of the, the material from the vapor phase to the liquid phase, um, and it gives up some of its enthalpy of vaporization uh, as it does so. That enthalpy of vaporization goes into our um, utility stream, or it, sorry, into our process stream, um, which is what we want. We want it to, to heat up. So using a, a phase change utility is nice um, because it'll ensure that it's a constant temperature, um, but also the latent heats of vaporization can absorb really big um, changes in temperature. So very, very, very hot thing or a, an enormous amount of energy is required to vaporize stuff. Um, and so it, it can be a very useful thing uh, for, for smoothing out spikes in temperature um, more so than, than a single phase utility. Oh yeah, thanks, Diana. So technically this NA0 should not be here um, because I'm just writing that as RA prime. Uh, so let's just, let's keep that here. Robin. Uh, if the so there's a question in chat. If I'm using boiling water to cool something, um, and it's at a constant temperature, do we treat that as liquid water or phase change? You would treat that as a phase change. You would only treat it as um, a liquid if, for example, it was chilled water and it went from 15 degrees C to like 50 degrees C. That would be a, a constant temperature or sorry, a, a non-phase change fluid. Um, and so you'd use liquid water for something like that. So we're a little bit behind our um, fika. We're on perfect pace in terms of, of material, so I don't need to keep 
pushing through for something like that. Um, but let's go ahead and take a take a fika break. Um, I think it's actually I think the terminology. I'm, I'm not s Swedish. I think the terminology is let's have fika or let's do fika, um, not let's take a fika break. So um, we'll throw on a little bit of music. We'll do fika until it's two fifty four now. Let's do. 307. Nobody uses sevens, right? Everybody just does 305 or 3 o'clock or 310. Let's be different. 307 p.m. Um, I, naturally, I'm going to hang out. So if you have questions or anything, feel free to show them up in chat. Um, but I'm not going to introduce anything new until 307. The only thing I'm going to do is switch over. Or not even switch over anything. Um, we'll just pull up a little bit of music. Unfortunately, this has got to be one of the royalty-free ones because it'll be right in the middle of the lecture. And if I try to mute that so the YouTube doesn't copyright it, uh, who knows if it'll actually work or not. Let's see, Kevin, what do you got for us today? I really like the builder. Let's do the builder again. Uh, over in the participants window, just give me like a, a thumbs up or a yes, no, if the, the music is, is okay. No, if it's too loud. Exactly zero, zero votes registered. I'm going to assume it's okay. explain to me what a star sign is before I can tell you what my is. I don't know what that means. Zodiac sign? Um, is that the one that's, when are you born? Like one month? Uh, I was born in September. Oh, there's two of them in September. Ooh, you could even be a Virgo in August. I know, I know.
Anybody watching all the chess streams on Twitch lately? They're great. I haven't played chess in forever, but I love watching. Chess, I've never even heard of it. Let's Google that. Kung Fu Chess. Without turns? Yeah, so that's probably too much for me. I get stressed out in that kind of situation. Like, Diablo 2 stresses me. Like, I don't know if I can handle that. I can barely handle it. That is kind of neat. Like, what would that be? Not, not like a mechanic, like giving them a cool down time. New music. Let's go see some of his new stuff. Okay, this is called Spellbound. Pretty quiet. heavy for Fika. Again, a little heavy for Fika. It's gonna go back to, I mean, it's, it's, I dig what you're doing here, Kevin, but it's a little much, so. for now.
Alrighty, this is our 307. Let's rock and roll. Put Kevin on pause. We'll pick up right where we left off here. Uh, we'll just keep adding to this. You get one big old page. Let's move that over to the side a little bit. There we go. Hey, where did my participants went? There you are. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, come on. Okay, that finishes Fika. Uh, so we um, just came off with our delta Q prime a little bit ago. Um, we calculated our U, uh, which was what we have here. Um, we just said the, the U is, is generally whichever one has the lowest um, individual heat transfer coefficients, H, U, or H. That tends to be the one that dominates. Um, the only time it really kind of looks like a mixture of the two is when they're similar. So Basically, anytime there's a gas, the U ends up looking pretty much like the the U for the gas. Um, it, it's not it's not great, but you know sometimes we got to work with gases, so that's how it goes. Um, row bed we're good with; don't have to worry about that. Um, TU is a constant, uh, so it's whatever our uh, steam temperature is, our saturated steam. T is also good to go because uh, that's one of the variables that we need to solve for. It's one of our dependent variables, um, and so the only remaining one here is the the A. Um, we are always going to work with cylindrical reactors. Um, so the A that we have will always be equal to 4 over D. Just keep in mind that the D that's here, um, this D, this is your reactor diameter, not your particle diameter, right? There's no subscript on it, um, so this is our uh, reactor diameter. Um, so if you calculate that as whatever, four over, what was our diameter? I think 12 centimeters, right? Four over 12 centimeters. Uh, what is that? One third. Oh, um, 0 0.3333333. If we did a, uh, text to chat, I'm sure somebody would start throwing sevens in right now. Um, but three, 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 et cetera per centimeter. So that's good, we've got that. Oops. Uh, and then we can just kind of keep going. Um, we're already in the area of uh, energy balances. So let's just scooch back up to the energy balance and see if there's anything else that we need to work with up here. Um, so here's our, our energy balance. Um, we just handled um, delta Q prime. Prior to that, we did delta H. We already had R prime. Uh, we're good with NA naught. It's, it wasn't explicitly given to us, but I mean, we were told the, the mole fraction and the total molar flow rate. So multiply the two and you got yourself a, an individual mole. Um, theta is fine. We know, we know all of the thetas. Keep in mind, by the way, this term here, Let's do a, a quick quiz, not unlike the quiz that was on the, the actual quiz earlier. Over in the participants window, use either yes or no to answer the following. Does this term include the inerts? I feel like the one person who voted no just saw the enormous number of yeses that were flooding in and you may have changed your vote for that. Um, yes, that, that term does include the inerts. How do we know it includes them? Because somewhere inside of there is a term theta i. So the i, the I does not distinguish, right? This sum is over all species z. Anything that's inside of that system is included in that sum. Um, and so somewhere along the way, there's a theta sub i times the heat capacity of I being the inert, that term is not zero. Um, the theta I exists because it was 80% inert, so it'll end up being about a four right there for a theta I, um, and I does have a heat capacity as well. This term over here, 
This one does not include the inerts. The reason that it doesn't include the inerts is because when you write out delta CP, this is the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients times CPs. And this stoichiometric coefficient of I, you can write that for any species I, and when you write it for capital I, the inert, that stoichiometric coefficient is zero. Um, and so the delta CP term will not have the inert sitting inside of it. So just a little bit of bookkeeping um, to keep in mind there. So inerts, yep, sure does. So we have the inerts inside of there, um, and then we're good with the rest of it. So we've kind of got all of our, our terms necessary for the energy balance, um, and we can move on down to the um, pressure drop, right? Our, our delta, PT, delta P dW term. Um, already highlighted here, is, it's like the 64 and the pi and the D and the D and the rho. Um, those are fine, right? Those are just constants, um, but we're still going to have to work on the V, the F, and the M. Um, and so that's what we'll do next. Uh, come back down here to the bottom of our notes. Uh, and we got to come up with uh, expressions for each one of those. Oops. Saved that. Um, I mean, we could pick any of them to get started with. I guess we'll just do the V first. Um, so our V, uh, generally the, the one that we use, which will work for either a single reaction or multi-reaction, uh, in a gas phase system is that the V anywhere inside of our reactor is equal to whatever it was coming in times NT over NT naught, uh, T over T naught, and P naught over P. But we need to write that in terms of X's, T's, and P's, and then any number of constants. Um, and so the one that has to get expanded a little bit is this NT over NT naught, uh, because the NT that's sitting here, this NT, uh, NT, is a function of conversion, All right? NT naught is a constant, um, but NT will be a function of conversion. Um, and so this one will be equal to V naught times one minus YA naught times delta divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of A times XA uh, and then times the rest of this stuff. So uh, T over T naught, P naught over P. This expression should look familiar. It's the same one that we used in the, um, or in the concentrations above. That's not a coincidence because concentration is moles per volume, or I should say moles per volumetric flow rate. Um, this exact expression was actually already used in our C terms. Uh, we just need the V because of the um, pressure drop. So we end up seeing it again. Um, and so the, the end result of this um, looks somewhat similar in the sense that that term inside of the uh, parentheses is 1 plus 0.2 xa and then times the same stuff outside t over t naught p naught over p so that looks similar to what it did um, earlier and then the uh, inlet volumetric flow rate uh, can be calculated from our ideal gas law as whatever the total coming in was times R T naught divided by our inlet pressure, which if you want to throw some numbers in there just so that you don't have to carry them around later, um, you could calculate this as 0 0.0346. And this is in cubic meters per second. So that'll be convenient. We'll come back to that. But remember, that's just V naught, right? In order to get V, we don't actually know what V is um, because V is now a function of XA, T, and P. Um, so we know what it is as a function of those, but it, it's not like we can just sit here and write down a number for it. Um, we have to calculate it as we go. Uh, or more specifically, we have to ask ODE45 to, to calculate it um, as we go. And then our last terms um, are all to do with the pressure drop term. Um, so our particle friction factor, that's the big one, that's our KTA expression. So this is 160 plus zero, or no, not wrong one, three times Reynolds number divided by one minus the void fraction, all of that raised to 0 0.9. And then on the other side of that is one minus the void fraction squared divided by the void fraction cubed, 
times the Reynolds number. And then just as an aside, don't forget that this, which is equation 10.7, or sorry, 10.17, this is a constant, right? So we really only need to calculate this once. Um, I have a tendency to put it into my code and just let MATLAB calculate it every time because it does not take MATLAB any significant time to just keep calculating it. Um, and it keeps me from making a mistake, right? If I substitute in a number wrong or something like that, it's really hard to check that. Um, but if MATLAB is just calculating it for you, then it's not so bad. Um, so each of the terms that are involved in here, uh, pretty much everything is uh, given except for the Reynolds number, um, right? The only other thing that's really in here is this void fraction. Uh, but we already know the void fraction was 45% uh, because that was given to us in the problem statement. So we don't have to worry too much about that. Um, but we're going to have to work on the Reynolds number a little bit. The Reynolds number, regardless of whether it's liquid or gas, always has the same form, uh, which is 4 times the total mass flow rate um, divided by pi d times mu. So let's just highlight what some of these terms are here. The mu here, uh, this is the Greek letter mu, uh, is the viscosity of the fluid. And it's always, I mean, uh, okay, it's not always. For this class, it's always one of two things, right? It's either the viscosity of a liquid or it is the viscosity of a gas. Um, the viscosity itself is a strong function of both composition and temperature. Um, and if it's in a gas phase, then the pressure as well. Uh, but they always end up being somewhere around, for a gas, something like 10 to the minus 3 pascal dot seconds. Sorry, for a gas, 10 to the minus 5 pascal dot seconds. For a liquid, they're on the order of about 10 to the minus 3. But under most conditions, and, and even fairly extreme conditions, it, it tends to be about 10 to the minus 5. Uh, this diameter here, again, this is our reactor diameter. Pi is pi. It has no, that is the one thing that is never used for a different... Oh, wait, no, actually, that's not true. Pi is also used to represent pressure, osmotic pressure. Uh, I was going to say pi is the only symbol that we don't like overload, that we don't give more than one meaning. Yeah, we do that one too. It also means osmotic pressure. Anyway, pi is just pi. It's 3.14. Um, and then our m sub t, we got to work on that a little bit because it's our total mass flow rate. Um, m sub t, there's kind of a nice, I don't even want to say it's a trick. It's just a nice way to analyze these things. If you don't remember what the total mass flow rate is and how it's related to like mole fractions and, and molar flow rates and all that kind of stuff, um, the, the trick that I like to do is to just start with kind of definitions and start substituting stuff in until it seems like I've got what I need. Um, and oftentimes that's, that's good enough. Um, so the total mass flow rate is the sum of all of the individual mass flow rates. Oh yeah, good point. It's also degrees of, pi is also degrees of freedom, see? Not even pi escapes us using it more than once, right? If I sum up each of the individual mass flow rates, then I have to get the, the total mass flow rate. Um, an individual mass flow rate uh, is related to a molar flow rate. If I take the molar flow rate and multiply it by the molar mass of I, that will give me a mass flow rate, right? Because you'll have a like a mole per second and then times something like a gram per mole. So I'll end up with like a, a gram per second or something like that. And then the mole of any component I uh, is equal to the mole fraction of I times the total moles of I, or sorry, the total moles times the molar mass of I. That NT is the same NT in all of those sums. So we can pull that out and get NT times the sum of yi molar mass of i. And this term uh, is usually what we're accustomed to writing as the average molar mass of a, a flow, right? When we wanted, if we wanted to work with air and we, we needed to know, you know, what's the average molar mass of air, we would take 29% times oxygen, which is what, 32 for its molar mass, uh, plus or no, 21 times 32 for oxygen, and then 79% nitrogen times 28 for its uh, molar mass. 
it's that sort of thing, right? But this is where it comes from, right? That's not an approximation, and that's just a term that pops up um, occasionally. So that will, because that is constant, um, we can use any of these, right? So in the same way that the molar mass, or sorry, the total mass flow rate uh, is equal to um, nt, yi, mi, that will also hold if you use the initial conditions. Uh, so nt zero times yi zero times the molar mass of i. I think that's pretty neat. Um, it's just conservation of mass, but I always think it's neat that mass is conserved. Like that's a cool concept to me. There's not very much stuff that does something like that. Um, so if we fill that in, um, our initial is 18 kilomoles per hour. Uh, and then times the sum, we've got 0 0.2 for A, um, and its molar mass was 58. And then we've got 80% inert, uh, and its molar mass was 28. Uh, and we can write that out and get 0 0.17 kilogram per second. Right? And that will be constant, right? Whether there's a reaction or not, it's the same mass flow rate um, going through there. I think that's neat. Um, and then if we, if we needed to calculate our Reynolds number, um, just be careful with the units, right? So our, our Reynolds number, if we were going to write everything in a consistent set of units, would be 4 times 0 0.17. Um, this is kilograms per second. 4 has no units on it. Pi has no units on it. The diameter that we have is the diameter of the pipe. So in meters, this will be 0 0.12. Uh, and then times the viscosity. Let me add the units on there. I don't want to forget the units. Uh, oh, come on. Close enough. 0 0.12 meters uh, times our viscosity, which is 10 to the minus fifth, or 10 to the minus five Pascal seconds. Right. This is a consistent set of units such that uh, if you were to go through and do the unit balance or the, the unit analysis on it, every one of these would cancel out. Um, the meters, obviously the seconds over here, Pascals. Pascals will have a, an inverse second squared on it so that everything will cancel out. Um, this is what we call a, a dimensionless number. It has no units associated with it. You can use any set of units you want to calculate the Reynolds number as long as they cancel out. Um, as long as you're not left with the ratios of, of any unit. Uh, and so what we're left with here is 1.8 um, times 10 to the fifth, uh, which if I were to write that in MATLAB would just be 1e5. And it has no units, so this is unitless. Don't feel bad for it though. It's very important. It more than makes up for its lack of units. Um, don't feel bad for the Reynolds number. It's used everywhere. So that gives us everything that we need for F sub P. Right, our F sub P then would be 160 plus three times our Reynolds number, which is one E five divided by one minus 0 0.45 raised to the point nine, all of that times one minus, I just wrote minus one, one minus 0.45 squared 0.45 cubed on the bottom, and then times the Reynolds number again, which is 1e to the fifth. I keep saying to the fifth, it's 1e to the five. You write all of that out, calculate that, throw that into a calculator if you want, you get 5.09. This is a, a, a couple of things. So the same way that m sub t was constant, but it had unit on it. Uh, RE is unitless, but it's also constant. The F sub P down here is also unitless, and it's constant. I am in the habit of transferring all of my units to base SI, uh, and oh God, stay far away from imperial units, because it's, it's a nightmare trying to track down unit conversions with imperial units at least try to work with SI um, to the point where you can calculate a Reynolds number kind of easily. Um, that's why you'll often see me writing this with like Pascal's. Um, about the farthest I go from Pascal's is 
maybe I will dip my toe into KPA or bar um, because I, I happen to remember those um, conversion factors, uh, but that's about as far as I go. Usually I try to stick with Pascal. It'll work, uh, it's just a pain in the neck. So finally we have calculated everything that we need, right? It took us like almost an hour just to get here to calculate everything. And we still haven't even put it in a MATLAB yet. Um, so here's what we're gonna do for, for MATLAB. My encouragement to you is to actually never do the types of calculations that we just did, and then try to put those calculated numbers inside MATLAB. The reason being, it's really hard to track down a mistake, right? If, if you look at your Reynolds number, you wanna, if, let's say you send me your code, right? And you've got Reynolds number is 6.3 times 10 to the minus six or something like that. All I can tell you is you calculated your Reynolds number wrong, right? I don't know if you left a number out. I don't know if you moved one from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom. I don't know if it was a unit conversion. Um, it's really hard if all you write is just Reynolds number is 1.8 times 10 to the fifth. It's really hard to troubleshoot that. Um, and I was, I graded your uh, recent homeworks in homework four. And I almost, virtually no one does that. Um, and that's great. Please don't do that. It's a bad habit to get into. Um, because it's really hard to troubleshoot that kind of stuff. So rather than put every single one of these back inside of MATLAB, um, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to, to practice your MATLAB. Um, and I'm just gonna give you the basic equations with those numbers evaluated. And then we're gonna stuff them in MATLAB and, and take a look at them. So it's up to you whether or not you wanna do that. Um, I mean, you'll still benefit, I think, just from the discussion we're about to have. Practice putting uh, above expressions into MATLAB. That's on you. I'm not gonna do that for you, but we're gonna give you a way to check your work. Right, you've got like five extra days for homework five. Hey, that's kind of coincidence. That's nice, I like that. Uh, you've got a bunch of extra time for homework five. So if, if you are a little bit, uh, unsure of the way that you were going about homework four, um, maybe take some time and practice this one uh, because I'm about to give you uh, a way to check your work. What I want you to do then is you can check it against the equations that I'm gonna give you here. So the equations I'm gonna give you, and this is all we're gonna put into MATLAB right now, K is four point 767 times e to the minus 3921 divided by t. Our rate r will be 0 0.0241 times k. Let's make that a little bit more obvious by putting k in parentheses. 241 times k, 1 minus xa on the top, uh, one plus 0 0.2 XA on the bottom times P over T. Our DXA DW will just be R. Our DT DW uh, would be equal to 3.947 minus 0 0.0081 times T minus 743.75 times R. Uh, and then our last one will be our pressure drop, which is DPDW. Uh, that's a weird looking one. I mean, they're all kind of weird right now. 4.734 times 10 to the sixth times one plus 0 0.2 XA times T over P. All right, so here I took this to the extreme, right? We needed to write everything in terms of temperature, pressure, and conversion, and then any number of constants. I have taken this to the extreme for you by setting up all of the units to make sure that they, they look correct. I have not told you what those uh, units are, except for the, the base units that we're gonna deal with here in a moment. Um, but you can use this set of equations to check your own um, 
MATLAB code, right? Because it'll they they should behave identically. Um, this set of solutions versus uh, any set that that you come up with. So to check these in MATLAB, the the approach that I would suggest that you do is set up two separate differential equations, right? Uh, or two separate scripts. On the one script, do the one that we're about to do, right? We're going to put this in MATLAB. It won't take very long. And then separately from that, imagine that this was given to you as a um, a problem, say a homework problem, and maybe go all the way back to here, right? And say, how would I solve this inside of MATLAB um, in the usual sense that, that we solve these, right? We start with writing our differentials, um, and then we express those as, as close to we can as the way that they are in the book, and then we start filling in equations afterwards. Um, normally, we do not substitute in values within MATLAB. Um, we let MATLAB do the substitutions for us. Uh, and so that's the, the part that I would like you to do. What we're going to do, though, to check it um, is solve this system of differential equations. Um, and we should end up with the, exactly the same thing as if you were to do it all by yourself in, in MATLAB. So the, the base units that we've got um, inside of here uh, can be indicated by our um, boundary conditions. So our boundary conditions here are that XA of zero kilograms is equal to zero. So that tells you that W is in units of um, kilograms of catalyst. Our T at zero kilograms, really kilograms of catalyst, um, is 500 K. And our pressure at zero kilograms is six times 10 to the fifth, right? So we're dealing with Pascals here. And then don't worry about the units of K, R, and all of those constants on there. If you throw in T is in K, P is in Pascals, and, and X is dimensionless, the result will be those as functions of kilograms of, of catalyst. So this is what I want you to check it against, right? It's as though I give you a um, partial solution or a, a selected answer or something like that. You don't have to try to substitute in and check like what's the 3.947, where did that come from? You can if you want to, you, you should be able to calculate stuff if you really want to, to show that it's 3.947, but you don't, right? If, imagine that this is what was, if this showed up in a homework assignment and I was trying to give partial credit for it, I have no idea where the mistake could be, right? That 3.947 probably has seven or eight different terms in it, all which is just a giant a jumble of units. Um, I have no idea how to tell you if that 3.947 is correct. I can tell you right now that should be correct. I, I think that these are, are correct. Um, it, it's just our, our way of showing you what the answer is without actually giving you the answer because um, I don't want to spend the next 25 minutes entering code um, into to MATLAB. So let's switch this over. Um, I'm, I'm going to switch over to MATLAB and we're going to enter these expressions into ODE 4.5 um, and then we're going to solve them uh, in an attempt to finally answer the question, how much conversion can we possibly get out of this system? So let's go ahead and switch over. Uh, and so let's go ahead and get started here. We need our um, initial conditions. Um, and so we're going to go zero temperature and pressure. Or sorry, X temperature and pressure, conversion temperature and pressure. So this looks like X, A, T, and P. We don't know how much catalyst we need, right? We're just going to start off with a number that we think is small just because we want the solver to, to solve, but we're going to come back to that W max, right? All we were uh, instructed in the problem statement was, tell me how much conversion is possible. That amount of conversion will obviously change with the amount of catalyst because that's changing the size of the reactor, but we don't know how much it is um, initially. Yeah, I'm going to upload this. Um, so we're just going to pick a small number. Um, you could pick something even smaller than that. Uh, maybe, you know, one times 10 to the minus three, something like that. Whatever. Uh, and then our solution will come from ODE 4.5 uh, over the range of 0 to W max, subject to our initial conditions. And then we'll just plot some stuff. Um, we'll do three plots. Uh, we'll do each one of them, right? So we'll do uh, our conversion. Um, 
to look like that. Uh, and then we'll do our temperature in the plot right next to it, which will be the second column. I always like to have a square axis because they look a little bit neater to me. And that'll be our temperature in K. Uh, and then we'll finally have our pressure. And I'm just going to mix the pressure up a little bit um, because we have a couple of different things to do with um, pressure. So we're going to plot both the regular uh, pressure, uh, but we're going to then divide it by the initial amount. So we're really plotting P over P naught, um, which we will uh, label as P over P naught. And that's usually nice because, you know, when MATLAB tries to do the axes as like times 10 to the fifth, it just gets a little bit confusing. So it's nice to just do it as P over P naught. Um, although that would not be necessary. Uh, and then we want to add a line. Remember, we were talking about um, the importance of atmospheric pressure um, in Monday's class. So we're going to add a line at atmospheric pressure. Uh, atmospheric pressure in units of Pascals is 101.325. But remember, we're plotting pressure over peanut. Um, and so I'm going to divide that by 6 e to the 5, because that's our peanut. So we're going to have a red line on our plot. Um, and that red line will represent atmospheric pressure, but in these normalized units of, of P over P naught. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and put our axis on uh, and say hold off for that one. Right, so we'll play a little game there with our, our plots, um, but we're expecting a plot of conversion, temperature, and pressure. And then we have to write our um, function down here. So that'll be a W and a Y. XA is the first element of Y because that's the way that we had defined it uh, in our initial condition. Um, just like T is the second entry and that's in units of Kelvin. Uh, and P is our third entry and that'll be in units of, of Pascals. We're still gonna end up with uh, Y DW, which will be DXA DW, DT DW, and DP DW. But those equations, so, so this is the part where it's like, what I would like you to practice if you're going to practice this problem is start going through this in the normal way that we write our code. Um, and so, for example, normally what we would do for pressure drop would be something like, okay, dp dw is minus v times f divided by rho bed, right? Blah, 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 for all of that other stuff, right? We're, we're writing it all in symbolically. Um, and then you can check it against what we're going to write here, which is 4.734 e to the minus 6 or sorry, e to the sixth uh, times the quantity of one plus 0 0.2 times xa times t divided by p, right? This form, fine, use it to check, and that I'm deliberately giving you this form as a, a way to check it, um, but we would not often write it in this form if we were trying to solve this problem, because how do you troubleshoot that, right? Where is the mistake? I, that's really tough to, to find the mistake um, in there. So 3.947 minus 0 0.008181 times T, uh, and then minus 743.75 times R for DT. And DXA is just R. R is 0 0.0241 times K. Uh, 1 minus XA divided by 2 times XA times P over T. By the way, coding in front of people is one of my least favorite things to do. But when there's this few elements that are in here, I feel like it's a little bit better to just code it all out um, than to just copy paste. Um, there's no mysteries here, right? You just saw me code everything, so there we go. So right, your, your mission, should you choose to accept it, would be rewrite these in the normal way that we would write them, right? In terms of expressions that you could find in your book. Um, and then define a bunch of constants. It's gonna take way more than five lines to do everything that we just did. Um, but the, the trade-off to that is you can actually troubleshoot it. Um, this, who knows, right? If I made a mistake on here, it's gonna be really hard to find. I checked it the other way, so it should be good. Um, let's go ahead and run this. Actually, we gotta save it. Um, in class, calls. Did you notice what pop? I don't know if you saw that pop up. I'm just going to assume nobody saw the pop up of what the other files in this directly were. Ooh, thank you. 743.75. Bink. 
I have no idea if that would make a big difference or not. It very well could. I, I don't want to risk it. Let's go with 0.75 because that's what I wrote before. Um, let's go ahead and save that. We, I can at least check this for typos because of just versus what I wrote um, a moment ago. Wait for my uh, plot window to show up over here. I'm going to go ahead and dock this. Uh, we'll move it over here. Close our workspace so that you can see it. Close our command window. So there we go. Right, and now we can kind of play the game of what is happening inside of our system. Well, the first thing that we can check is what we had anticipated earlier, right? The, one of the first things that we had said was, had this system been isothermal and isobaric, we would have expected complete conversion of, of A. We can test that. The way that we can test that is to change our um, expressions for dpdw and dtdw. If we set those equal to zero, we should be able to just keep upping the um, kilograms of catalyst until we get 100% conversion. So if we change those to zero and run this script again, where did my plot, did my plot change? Oh yeah, it did change, right? It, it is now 500 constant. Our, our pressure is actually up here at the um, very top of it, um, which I think I'm actually plotting something over and over and over again. We might have to come back to this uh, pressure plot here. Um, in, a, in a moment, but let's keep upping the, the kilograms of catalyst, right? One did okay, so let's try 10. Uh, okay, not too much changed, right? I'm really curious why my, uh, I called my hold on right there, and then I, eh, we'll come back to it. Uh, I'm eventually gonna have to, to clear this because I'm not sure exactly why that thing keeps plotting on the same one. Um, I can increase it again and go out to maybe 100 kilograms of catalyst uh, and okay, right? My X is starting to go all the way up to one, but even after 100 kilograms of catalyst, my temperature has not changed and my pressure has not changed. The reason being I have forced them to be the same, right? I have artificially modified my system just to do a little sanity check on myself, which is in a big enough system, if the reaction is irreversible and it's isothermal and isobaric, I ought to be able to get 100% conversion. But let's see if that actually happens, right? Um, let's put in, for let's leave it isothermal and just put our pressure drop in and see what we can get, right? So this is the equivalent of a system that is isothermal, but not isobaric. And let's reset our W back down to one, right? We'll do this same thing and just kind of keep upping the Ws and looking at what happens inside of our plot um, until something interesting um, happens. I think if I move this down here, I'm going to close this just once and rerun it. I'm trying to get that plot to update for us. Um, so here we are, back down to one kilogram of catalyst. Again, it's isothermal, so the 500 is always going to be flat. Um, our pressure drop is up here. This uh, red line, um, let me change the way that I'm sharing this just so that you can see my pointer because uh, it's a little bit weird to... I don't think you can see my pointer when I'm um, moving it around the other way. There we go. So our temperature here, um, still flat, because we're sort of artificially looking at this as an isothermal system. Our pressure is just barely starting to fall, right? If I move my mouse away, you can kind of see that the value over here is just ever so slightly smaller, but we're nowhere near this limit of atmospheric pressure. So let's update the kilograms of catalyst a little bit. Let's go up to 10 kilograms of catalyst and rerun this. And so great, we're increasing our conversion a little bit. We're up to 0.4, temperature is still constant. And now we're starting to see where one of the limitations is going to come in, right? Our pressure is starting to fall. Let's do this again up to about 50 kilograms of catalyst. Cool, we're getting up close to around like 80, 85% conversion over here, maybe 84, something like that. Still isothermal. Our pressure though is starting to get pretty close to atmospheric, right? Remember this red line that we plotted down here? Um, this represents atmospheric pressure. And as we had talked about in Monday's class, that's sort of a practical limit for most systems, right? It is not physically impossible to operate a system below atmospheric pressure, 
But if you want to do that, you got to pay money for it um, because somewhere in your system has to be a pump that's actually pulling on this stuff um, in order to get it out of the system because you're operating below atmospheric pressure. Um, so we can up our uh, catalyst a little bit more. Let's go from 50 to 60. Pressure dropped even a little bit more. Let's go up to 70. There we go. So after a little bit less than 70, um, you see that we have actually stopped, right? 70 is somewhere around here. Um, and our lines have all artificially stopped, right? X has sort of come up to here and it has stopped at around, what is that? 88.7%. The reason that it has stopped is because we have hit that, that fundamental limit, right? We, we blew right through atmospheric pressure here and said like, okay, we can keep going a little bit if somebody pays a bunch of money and pulls a vacuum on this thing. But eventually you get to a point here where you do not have enough pressure in your system to keep pushing this through your catalyst. Um, and that hard limit is where this line stops, which tell me over in the chat, can you see the pop-up window that just came up there? It should say 67.04. Can you see that? Okay, you can see that. So I'm just hovering on top of that. That is the highest I can go. Um, if I go any higher than that, the, the pressure will go below zero, absolute, um, and you can't do that. There, that's a fundamental limit. Um, there, there's nothing below zero pressure, the same way there's nothing below zero Kelvin. There's a warning that MATLAB will give you if you're to there. It's in your um, command window when you run these things. Let me dock this really quick, restore that. If you look at what happened when I ran that script, MATLAB has given me a warning that says you have failed in your integration. The dependent or the independent variable in ODE 4.5 is always called T. Don't worry that it says T, that, that's really W. It's just something that um, MATLAB does. If you see something like warning failure at this inside of ODE because you haven't met integration tolerances, try plotting your pressure. Um, it's almost certain that your pressure has fallen off a cliff over here. That's not uncommon. Um, that's in fact the, the type of process that you're gonna investigate on one of your homeworks is how big can I go? The limit of what you can do is either temperature or pressure, right? Either you just run out of temperature um, and the reaction stops or you run out of pressure um, and the reaction basically can't proceed because you can't actually pump anything through your um, system. So the, the fundamental limit if the system was isothermal is about 88.76% conversion. Let's look at in our last couple of minutes here, last one minute, back at the, the full system, which is non-isothermal and non-isobaric. So we'll put DT, DW back inside of here. Run our script again. So with just 10 kilograms of, of catalyst, we've had uh, quite a bit of um, drop in our temperature right here. Remember, it's an endothermic reaction, uh, but the pressure hasn't fallen too much. So let's go ahead and switch this from 10 kilograms. We'll go up to 20. Still okay. Everything is moving. Let's try 50. Still not too bad, right? We've, we've lost a lot of temperature here. Um, can we get up to 70 kilograms? Still okay on 70, right? So we've actually now gone beyond the amount that we had in our isobaric system. The reason being the cooling of the temperature has reduced the pressure inside of there and that has reduced our, our pressure drop. So we can actually go even higher now. Uh, let's try 80. Can go a little bit more and we can go up to 90, eh, a little bit higher, maybe even all the way up to 95 kilograms of catalyst, right? Something up around there, uh, maybe 100 is about the highest we can go. Yeah, pretty close to 100, um, right? And what we see is the endothermic reaction has absorbed heat. Um, we have not supplied enough energy from our saturated steam to stop the temperature dropping, but eventually the reaction slows down so much down here uh, that we are not absorbing too much energy anymore. Um, and so the, the temperature starts to turn around because now you're actually heating it up from the, the steam on the outside. But notice we've hit a limit here that's quite a bit lower, right? We can't get too much more than about 30% conversion because our pressure has finally fallen off of the cliff. Um, so it, it's a very complicated problem to say, how big should our reactor be when you have both pressure drop and temperature? Um, you have to kind of take an approach that's, that's like this. And this is the approach that you're gonna do on um, one of the homeworks. Um, so I'm gonna leave it here. We're at 351, I don't wanna go 
um, any further than this. I will post this code. Um, it, it's similar to, to what you're going to have to do um, on the um, homework five. So stay well out there, stay healthy. We will see you on Friday. You'll see me on Friday. I'm taking over for John on Friday. We're just going to look at more examples on Friday. Um, I'm going to stick around and I am going to answer some questions that are over in chat. Um, we'll throw on a little bit of scheming weasel again. Stay safe out there. Um, we'll see you soon. Okay, so um, chat questions over there. Can you have pump stations? Yes. Um, so, you know, what, what can you practically do if I needed more than 30% conversion and my pressure fell off with that? You can put in what are called interstage pumps, um, which is basically you make a reactor that holds about maybe 60 kilograms or catalysts, something like that. And then you pop it out of the reactor, run it through a pump to repressurize it, run it through another reactor. Um, yeah, you can definitely do something like that. There's another version of that too called interstage heating and interstage cooling, um, which is covered in your book if you're interested in it. We just don't have time to get to it this quarter. But yes, you can run it through uh, chains of reactor pump, reactor pump, or for gases, it would be reactor compressor, reactor compressor. Um, you would want to try to avoid it with a compressor though, because compressors are really expensive to buy and operate um, because they have a lot of moving parts that are subjected to very large pressures um, and very large forces inside of them. So if you can avoid uh, adding another compressor, try it, because um, you'll probably save a lot of money. Compressors cost like millions of dollars a year to run. Um, they are very energy intensive. Um, for question one on the homework, what range should the diameter be? Mm, I'm not going to tell you. My, my advice for that would be start out big. Right. If, if you start out on the bigger side of the um, diameter, that will keep the pressure drop from being a problem. Um, and then you can start to reduce the diameter and the pressure drop will get higher and higher. So the, the actual pressure will get lower and lower. Um, so if you start off on the bigger side, then you can kind of um, back it down. If the bigger side doesn't work, turn it around and start really small. Um, but if you start small, usually the, the pressure has a problem. If T starts at 350, then our temp versus W will become less curvy. Um, I don't know. Uh, that, that's an interesting uh, problem, right? It, what if I change my inlet temperature to just something that's here? Will it just start going up? It may not um, because you're actually slowing the reaction down initially. Uh, and you can do what's called quenching the reaction, where it's basically so cold that it never gets going. Um, and that's usually specific to an individual problem. So when I say I don't know, you'd have to go back and, and resolve the system with a, a different um, inlet temperature to see what happens there. But if, if you want to make a more predictable temperature change, one of the things that you can do is throw more inert into the system, right? That inert will tend to either carry along, it, it, it generally acts like a buffer to temperature changes. Um, and so if you're worried about it, you can, you can throw more inert into something. I, I, I am almost 100% sure that summer classes are remote. I mean, not 100% not sure, but like really close to 100% sure it, they're going to be remote. Yeah, th there seems to have been a problem with... Um, I don't want to say there's a problem. There seems to be a discrepancy between the way that we understand the classes to be operating and what the registrar put on the schedule of classes. We think that they had to force, for whatever the computer system is, they had to put room numbers on there. Um, but we also asked them to provide some clarity on that because it's confusing, right? You've, it looks like you're signing up for an in-person class, but it's almost certainly going to be remote. Um, so we have asked the registrar uh, to send out some clarification on that. Um, yeah, I did mention something earlier about PFR versus PBR. It was actually PFR versus CSTR. Um, so I haven't posted the final um, project statement, but if you wanted to get a head start on it, you're going to have to do a PFR um, in place of the CSTR uh, that was used in midterm project two. So you can skip right to that last problem in midterm project two. 
and basically repeat it, except switch the CSTR out for PFR. Um, it's it's going to be that. It's going to be that. Yeah, I, I, it is confusing. I, I wish they had announced that beforehand. seems like we've wrapped everything up so i'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording if you're watching on youtube we'll see you on friday <laughs>